Hey there Poetry Pals, welcome back to another video. This week we are talking about Kate Clanchy and her book, Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me. In case you missed it, over the last two weeks in the UK, the writing community has been uproar on Twitter over um, Kate's language in this book. Um, people have said that she has used racist, ableist and fat phobic language um, throughout the book and there has been uproar over how Kate has responded to that, as well as the behaviour of the publishers and some writers within the community as well. In this video, we're gonna run through a timeline of events. I'm also gonna talk about my reaction to the book, as well as what we can learn from this situation and what we can do um, going forward. So something to bear in mind as we go through is this video is going to contain quotes from the book, which do include um, racist and um, fat phobic and ableist language and so if that's something that you're not in a space to hear please do look after yourself um, but we are going to be talking about that so just bear in mind but before we go any further please make sure you like this video um, subscribe to my channel and comment because it really helps small creators like me get found I make videos about all things poetry and while we're on the subject why don't you follow me on social media I am at Josie Alford poet on all the things so first up before we go any further I think an important question to answer is who is Kate Clanchy not to be confused with Kate Clancy, who is a scientist in America, who has worked a lot on loads of interesting stuff, who I accidentally Googled a couple of times when researching this video. Kate Clancy is a Scottish poet and writer and teacher. She has won over 15 awards for her work and her writing. She's also very well known for her work in schools. In fact, she originally trained as a teacher and her latest book, Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, is about her work in schools. Quick side note, as we go through this, I'm just going to refer to the title of the book as Some Kids instead of the full thing, just to save time. I first heard about her when I was doing my masters in creative writing. One of the people I study with was a huge fan of hers. And so we ended up, I'm pretty sure we ended up studying a couple of her poems um, during this process. As a result, I started following her on Twitter and um, she became someone I recognised in my timeline a lot. She would frequently share poems that her students had written. So let's run through the timeline of events. First up, Some Kids was published in 2019. The important thing to bear in mind here is that the editing team and whoever read this book before publishing it read it and thought, yep, yeah, sounds great let's go then in the summer of 2020 the book won the orwell political writing book award orwell political writing book prize orwell political writing book prize i think the word book is in there because there's awards for other writing as well the important thing to bear in mind here is that four judges read it and thought yep yeah, Sounds great. Not only is it great, it's award worthy. This is what they said about the book. In this book, a brilliantly honest writer tackles a subject that ties so many people up in knots. Education and how it is inexorably, inexorably dominated by class. Yet this is the very op opposite of a worthy lecture. Clanchy's reflection on teaching and the stories of her students are moving, funny, full of love and offer sparkling insights into modern British society. <sighs> so then later that year, a, a user on Goodreads publishes this review. The review itself is a lot longer. I'm only going to read the first two paragraphs and bear in mind here that in some language that you might find upsetting. I'm a teacher myself and I had so many issues with this book. The narrative is centered on this white middle-class woman's harmful, judgmental and bigoted views on race, class and body image. The young people she describes are narrowly fitted into these preconceived categories and Clanchy doesn't seem to view them through any other lens. 
Firstly, Kate Clanchy describes young people of colour as racist stereotypes. She describes students as so Afghan and black young people with chocolate skin, others with slanted eyes, almond shaped eyes, an African voice or a Jewish nose. She calls one young person African Jonathan. Clanchy's viewpoints on young people of colour are bigoted and I find it uncomfortable that she is profiting from their life stories as a middle class white woman. These young people have interesting stories and write wonderful poems, yet it's Clanchy who controls the narrative and makes the money from them. The review then goes on to talk about how there is ableist and fat phobic language as well. Um, I'm not gonna lie, the review is so long, it doubles the length of my script, but I will link to the Goodreads page below where you can read the rest of it. Then nothing really happens until the 30th of July this year, nine months after this Goodreads user posts their review. When Kate Clanchy herself tweets about it. In a now deleted tweet, I didn't manage to get a screenshot of the original tweet, but it was in a thread. She wants to remove reviews on Goodreads and she encourages her audience to flag the reviews, later saying, none of these terms are in my book, it's all made up. This resulted in quite a few people sharing screenshots of the book. The most notable one being one by at calamity with a K saying, but Kate, a lot of these terms are in your book with screenshots. This thread grew and grew with lots of people wading in with their opinions and if things weren't bad enough, Philip Pullman came in and started criticising writers of colour who had legitimate criticisms of the book. He tried to say that some of them hadn't even read the book. Over the next few days, Manisha Rajesh, Chimen Suleiman and Professor Sunny Singh were all in various Twitter threads trying to explain exactly what they did wrong. They were in these threads trying to explain exactly why Kate Clanchy had gone so wrong and why this way of describing children is so bad. And almost immediately these three people were involved in um, a lot of online abuse and were receiving a lot of really horrendous hate from within and outside the writing community, including from Philip Pullman. Including from Philip Pullman, who in a mistaken tweet about, in a mistaken thread about something totally different, thought that they were tweeting about the Kate Clanchy thing and described the people who were criticizing Kate Clanchy as maybe finding their home in ISIS or the Taliban. When you realize how wrong that is, right? Like. Ooh, the Islamophobia present in that tweet is not cool. Philip Pullman has since apologised for it, but damn. In early August, so like literally in the last few days, um, the original reviewer who Kate screenshotted and tweeted about wrote, over a series of months since I posted this review, the author has threatened to contact my employer and she has orchestrated her followers on Twitter to comment on it, report it and contact Goodreads, etc. She has accused me of defamation and abuse, although now all of her comments have gone. The quotes I have given are obviously from the book and some are available online as previews, so it's baffling to me why Kate denies all of them. The public accusation from Kate that I have organised a pile on with friends is untrue. This was my honest review and was completely unrelated to any other reviews the book has received. Rather, I would hope that Kate and people who read this book without criticism can take some time to reflect on the racism, xenophobia, anti-semitism, fatphobia, transphobia and classism which runs through the book. We are all continuously learning but we must address our behaviours and be willing to do the work rather than deny them. Lastly, despite the threats I will not take down my review. I felt and feel it was important to speak up for the young people that I believe this book lets down. So the next big day is the 6th of August, which was a Friday. And Kate Clanchy and her publishers, Picador, released their first apologies. So Kate Clanchy tweets out this thing with a, 
a screenshot of this text saying, the last few days have been humbling. I have been privileged to learn every day from wonderful students who have taught me about the world through their eyes. As every teacher knows though, education is never complete. Many of the responses to the extracts of my book, especially those taken out of context, have been difficult to hear, but I am grateful to those who took the time to challenge my writing and to present me other lenses through which my words might be read. I will continue to strive for self-knowledge about my role in the classroom and the privileges I enjoy. I will also take time to reflect upon views of the many readers of colour who have responded to my writing to put these learnings into practice in my work both as a teacher and a writer. Hi video editing JC here just hopping on to ask where's the actual apology? Where does she say sorry in any of this? What? I mean, she says she's going to learn and everything, but there's no, there's no actual apology here. Mm. And next up, I'm going to read you the first statement that um, Picador released. One paragraph, here we go. Picador published Clay Clanchy, Some Kids I Have Taught, and what they taught me in 2019. We have read and understood readers' responses to the book. We are grateful for the insights that this exchange has given us as we and we continue as a company to strive and become ever more inclusive. To do this, we will listen and learn. We are discussing the best way to update the book for future editions. I think one of the key things that this discussion is leaving out is the fact that these three writers of colour were receiving such horrendous online abuse while this was happening. But don't worry, Picador is continuing to listen and learn. I think another thing to bear in mind here is that they are talking about updating the book. I think one of the biggest criticisms that people have of this book so far is that not only is this language deeply problematic, but that Kate Clanchy and her publishers are profiting off of that. So, on the same day, the 6th of August, um, a poet, Anthony Anaxaguru, tweets about the subject. I think this view is very important and kind of sums up well what people have been saying in various other threads. So, regarding the Kate Clanchy debacle, the criticism levelled against her book is fair in that it brings into question her ethical practice as well as her constant use of Orientalist language when speaking particularly about young people of colour. I found some gids kids very difficult to read. The weird ongoing bodily comments and depictions, dated tropes and general fetishization of children of colour ended the book's intention for me. I, like many others here, have worked with young people for over a decade and while we all have our own way of doing things, I've always felt uncomfortable at some of the ways Kate has gone about showcasing her students' work. While I'm sure her intentions are benign, it's the undertone of middle middle class white paternalism that taints everything. 20 years ago, I would have probably been one of the kids Kate's taught. There needs to be a more robust conversation about the role of teachers with a public profile, the power dynamics at play, and how cultural capital is accrued and redistributed through the experiences of students. Personally, I am not an advocate of cancel culture. I think we're all learning. Some of us just do it in public. I think, however, there needs to be some reckoning when an author openly dismisses the legitimate grievances of the very people they've made the subject of their work. To rebuke or try to launch a counterattack when the evidence is looking at you in the face is frankly foolish. Those who've rightly quick criticised the work, have done so using whole contextualised extracts from the book. It is not unfounded or a diatribe. Some Kids I Taught, along with Antigonia and Me, raises very serious questions around racist language, positioning, the Orientalist gaze and the paternalism attributed to the British Imperial Project, along with the inability to concede error. 
People of colour, working class groups and those living with disabilities should not be used as fodder by the white middle classes to try and achieve some kind of political exoneration. More honest discourse on the matter is very much needed. This thread from Anthony absolutely pulls together like the criticism of exactly what is the problem with her writing and the fact is is that Anthony has found that her writing in other books includes this as well. So the first two apologies come out on August 6th and then it's the weekend and no one really tweets anything apart from these horrendous trolls who are going after um, these three writers of colour. So um, just going to share you a tweet that Sunny Singh wrote. Tomorrow is a Monday and I expect I will have that regular line management conversation about people demanding that I be fired for speaking against racism. I'll take negative Goodreads reviews over emailed, postal and in-person threats and harassment any damn day. Just exhausted. Good night, stay safe and be kind. None of this would have happened if Kate Clanchy hadn't centred herself as the victim for getting negative re Goodreads reviews. It's crazy. Anyway, Monday rolls around. Another writer whose work I definitely recommend checking out is Pragya Agarwal, who wrote um, a article called Impact Not Intent on the bookseller website, which was published on August 9th. Um, this is particularly really good insight on what it means to be a writer of colour and having a marginalised voice and stuff like that. I think she also really perfectly describes how to deal with getting called out. We all make mistakes and we all carry stereotypes and biases, but instead of putting up fences when this is brought to our attention, we can use them in, as learning moments. In all my consultancy work and talks, one motto that I insist one motto that I insist on is to focus on the impact, not the intent. When we focus on the intent, we center ourselves, but when we open focus on the impact our words and actions might have on others, we can metaphorically step into their shoes and see what the world might look like from their perspective. A really good advice there on how um, Kate might have been centering the intent of what she intended to do with that book rather than the impact it actually had. And we also have a second statement from Kate Clanchy and her publishers Picador. I'm going to start with the one from Picador. We've been listening to the responses to what we said about Kate Clanchy's Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, and we want to apologise profoundly for the hurt we have caused, the emotional anguish experienced by many of you who took the time to engage with the text and hold us to account. We realise our response was too slow. We vigorously condemn the despicable online bullying of many of those who have spoken out. There is no this has no place in our community. We understand that readers wish to know specifically what will be done about the book. We're actively working on this now and we will communicate this as soon as possible. On the same day, that evening, Kate Clanchy tweets, I have been given the chance to do some rewriting on some kids. I am grateful. I know I got many things wrong and welcome the chance to write better, more lovingly. To people saying I shouldn't centre myself in kids' lives, I agree. I have been worrying about this for years. I hope you will be able to see them better. Now I am knocked off my pedestal. And I apologise to you for overreacting on the Goodreads reviews. It was wrong. I don't really have an excuse, except that I am bereaved and it takes people in different ways. I am not a good person. I do try to say that in my book. Not a pure person, not a patient person, no one's saviour. You are right to blame me and I blame myself. Okay, in my opinion, there are three key issues with this tweet. One, they're rewriting the book. I'm gonna talk about this later as well. Two, she says that she has gone through a bereavement and that is why she is acting irrationally. And as someone who has also gone through a bereavement, um, all my sympathy goes out to her, absolutely. But it is definitely not an excuse um, for what's happened. Um, the fact is, is that you uh, accused someone 
who quoted from your book of of making those quotes up so either you knew they were correct and said um no 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 you're wrong and thought that your influence as um someone with a large audience would carry you through or you forgot what you wrote in your own book and i don't think that grief can do anything for that once again sorry to hear you're going through bereavement it does suck don't think it's an excuse for behaving the way you did and then finally she has really centered herself in this um and that you know she centers herself of being like i'm not a good person i'm not a good person and the fact is is that this isn't about being a good person this is about using racist language when talking about children on the 10th of august which is the tuesday um the orwell foundation uh releases a statement the orwell foundation acknowledges the concerns and hurt expressed about kate clanchy's memoir some kids i taught and what they taught me the winner of the orwell prize for political writing 2020 the foundation understands the importance of language and encourages open and careful debate about all the work which comes through our prizes. Everyone should be able to engage with these discussions or any platform without fear of abuse. The Orwell Prizes are awarded by a panel of independent judges appointed each year by the foundation who take their own decisions as to the awards in each category. The foundation does not comment on individual judging panel decisions. This is PR at its finest. Doesn't really say anything. And hey, it also really pushes it onto the um, judging panel um, instead of them. Anyway, on Wednesday, the 11th of August, um, they released, Picador released another statement. Kate Clanchy is extremely sorry for the upset caused by her book and is grateful for the insight of writers and communities affected by it. She welcomes the opportunity to update some kids I taught and what they taught me and will work with Picador to do so. Picador proposes to consult an appropriate group of specialist readers about the update and hopes to release a new edition in the autumn. To tackle the wider issues this experience has taught us about, we at Picador and Pan Macmillan, which is the overall place, are reviewing our editorial processes and considering how we implement more rigour in our assessment of manuscripts, including guidance for commissioning sensitivity reads and more. Okay, so I'm filming this on Friday. It looks like that is the update so far. So where it is left to be clear is um, Kate Clanchy and Picador have agreed that they are going to rewrite it. They might get some people in to consult on the book and then they'll re-release it in the autumn. The Twitter storm is still ongoing. I cannot keep up to date with all the tweets about it, but there you are. So. Here are my thoughts. So when all of this started kicking off online, I started talking to my friends about it and none of them really knew it was happening. So I decided I wanted to make a video about it, pulling together as much as I could about the situation so that people could learn about it in one place rather than having to scroll through all the various Twitter feeds, which, pow. I don't think even I've done it successfully. But I realised that if I was going to make a video on it, I should probably read the book, you know, do the research, be as knowledgeable on it as possible. So I bought the book secondhand online. But because this week has been incredibly busy for me, I also decided to get it on Audible so that I could listen to it. And let me tell you, listening to Kate Clanchy read this book does not make it any less problematic. If anything, it is more so. So when reading the book, I decided to put a post-it note in every time I felt uh, uncomfortable by the way she had written about these children. And well, here you go. There's no colour coding here. This is just because I kept running out of the same colour. So yeah, 
There is not a single chapter in this book which doesn't have something that feels really weird. And I think something that Anthony touched on in his thread is that it is the way she is writing about children and children's bodies specifically. I think that there is this need to describe the way children look um, that doesn't sit right with me. And largely all of the issues with this book fit into that category of weirdly describing children's bodies. There are, other than the bit where she talks about her quiet foreign girls, which don't even get me started. But like, for example, and all of these are mentioned in the review, um, the Goodreads review, but there's this bit where she's talking about this working class girl um, who has rotten teeth and describes her as having uh, poverty stamped through her core like a stick of rock that shows in her rotten teeth or something and okay yeah the way she talks about children's bodies is awful um, and there's particularly a focus on race and foreignness within that but also about um, fat phobia and talking about poor white children's bodies as well um, and this lens is super weird and it made me very uncomfortable to read it. So on the subject of rewriting, if this is all of the problems I found, how are you supposed to be able to rewrite this book if everything in it is a problem? There's some where I just don't understand how you could be able to rewrite this book to make it okay because it feels like this language is stamped on this book through the core like a stick of rock and how are you supposed to remove that whilst leaving the book to exist? I did find the way she talked about teaching English quite interesting but that was such a small section of the entire book that it is not worth reading for it. So by the way, if anyone does want to borrow this, they absolutely can. You don't have to pay for it, whatever. Just get in touch and I'll lend it to you. Let's not send any more money their way by buying the book. Just borrow it off me, thanks. So let's go through. What did Kate Clanchy do wrong here? Well, she wrote a book that contained racist, ableist, fat phobic and classic, classist language throughout that shows, that reflects an attitude that is problematic. The way she writes about children in it is really weird and one of the things you've got to realise is that she is writing about children. One thing I didn't make entirely clear about what exactly is wrong here is it is not just the language, it is the attitude and the behaviour behind it. Everything about this like smacks of this white middle class superiority thing, this sort of like white saviour complex thing. It's deeply problematic and it reduces these children to being like objects of fascination and pity and mm, it's not right. I think, to be honest, I think Anthony's um, tweets that I read out earlier in this video perfectly sum up exactly what's wrong. Um, so yeah. The next thing is, is that she profited from this language. People buying her book has given her money. She has made money off of these views. When people, rightfully so, called her out on this language, she tried to deny it and even went so far to try and discredit people who called her out on it, including this Goodreads user who she threatened to contact their employer. And she has not apologised to the women who have received so much online abuse for talking about her that way. She has centred herself as the victim in all of this. Okay, so what has the industry done wrong? And in this case, I'm talking about her publisher, Picador and wider Pam Macmillan, um, but also 
the Orwell Foundation. The fact is, is that during the editing stages, people read this and no one stood up to talk about it, to say that this was wrong that we currently know about. Maybe someone did, but they weren't listened to. The book even won an award. And now they are going to try to continue profiting off of these views by rewriting it. And I question whether that is even possible. So what can we as <coughs> people, um, consumers, writers, and um, people who work in the publishing industry, what can we learn from this? Well, First of all, when people of colour call you out on a behaviour, listen to them, apologise and learn and move on. If we carry privilege, it can be easy to be unaware about how our words can have impact to people who do not carry that same privilege. So when someone does call you out on a behaviour, if you are not part of that community, you need to listen to it. And as Pragya Agarwal said, to centre the impact, not the intent. It doesn't matter whether you intended to be offensive or not. What matters is, is that you were. That impact was causing offence. So apologise, move on. Also, I think an important note here is what to do when you're writing about another person's experience and writing about the other and by that I just mean writing about someone whose experience is different from your own and Sunny Singh or Professor Sunny Singh has written a list of questions that we as writers can ask ourselves when writing. One, why do you want to write this? What is your motivation? Two, what is your personal, emotional, psychological and ethical investment in writing it? Three, can someone else tell this story better or is it someone else's story to tell? Four, what does your telling of the story do? Does it replicate prior violence, impression, oppression or injustice? Does it provide new understanding or insight? What is your power balance or imbalance as a writer to the subject matter? Finally, should you write or publish this at all? As with most ethical questions, the key is not can one, but should one. I just want to say thank you for Professor Sunny Singh for putting together such brilliant questions that maybe people might not have thought to ask themselves before writing. And to be clear, these questions aren't saying that you can't write about another experience. It's just about making sure that you're not appropriating someone's experience or using doing it in a really bad way so thank you for sharing those questions i think one of the final things that we can learn from this is that we need diversity throughout all levels of publishing not just writers but also the editors and the readers and all of those sorts of people behind the scenes of the publishing industry because if someone of color had read this at, during the thing and maybe spoken out about it maybe this book wouldn't have happened. Which I think leads to why we might need to address equality, diversity and inclusion throughout the university and education system. Stuff like the um, attainment gap and um, diversity within the curriculum would be key things. So what can we do about it? One, you can buy the books of those writers of colour who thankfully spoke out on this subject. I bought a load too. It's worth saying that um, Hotel Arcadia is currently out of stock wherever I found it, but I have signed up to buy it as soon as it's available. We can support these writers of colour. You can follow them on social media. I will share their usernames here and I will link to their um, Twitters in the description down below. And if you're white and watching this, we can do the work. We can learn about racism and our privileges. I'll include a load of resources in the description down below, which include books and podcasts and stuff like that. If you're, re if you're watching this video and you have a recommendation that I haven't included in the description, please comment below with those recommendations and we can 
build a resource that as writers, as white people, we can learn more about it. And then we can also support the campaigns in our circles that lead to greater diversity within our industry, whether that's as writers or wherever it is we're working. It is a well-known fact that having diversity in business and industry leads to more um, diversity of thought um, and at this point I'm just going to recommend uh, this business consultant ding, who was part of a talk that I um, watched at Valley Fest who does business consultancy about diversity so check out her work as well. I want to end on what do you guys think of this? What are your thoughts? Have you read the book? How did it make you feel? And what have you learnt from all of this? Do you think it is possible for Kate Clanchy to rewrite this book and for it to come back out? Or do you think that we should let this book lie and not have it anymore? Let me know in the comments down below. So that's it for this week's video. Please do comment your thoughts, like this video and subscribe. As I said, I make videos about all things poetry. To support the channel, you can um, become a Patreon, you can buy me a coffee, or you can follow me on social media. I am at JC Alford Poet on all the things. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all next week. Bye.